Good morning uh, and welcome to the Bessie decommissioning orphan wells on the Outer Continental Shelf draft RFP virtual industry day presentation. My name is Michael Berry and before we get started, I wanted to share a couple of ground rules. As a team's live event, attendees will not be able to speak directly to the presenters. If you have a question or comment during the presentation, please use the live Q&A function to post your question. We will be monitoring those questions as they're posed and we'll address those toward at the end of the presentation. Also, this presentation is being recorded and along with the full PowerPoint, it will be posted to the SAM.gov and Betsy.gov websites for future reference or review. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Brian Domingue, the Acting Gulf of Mexico Regional Director, who will start us off with introductory remarks. Thank you, Mike. Good morning to everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you here with us. Um, but I, I'd also like to thank Dan Wright with the with Bessie's Office of Policy and Analysis for coordinating today's event and everyone else uh, involved in this process. Uh, you'll be hearing from quite a few of them here today. As Mike said, uh, currently I'm the acting regional director for Bessie here in the Gulf of Mexico region, region. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Bessie uh, and what we do, you know, we are an agency uh, affiliated with the Department of Interior. And, and our mission through our mission statement is to, you know, promote safety, protect the environment and conserve resources through offshore regulatory oversight and enforcement. What's the purpose of this event today? Uh, it, it's basically to familiarize you with the this first of a kind endeavor for Bessie, which is contracting for temporary abandonment decommissioning services on the US outer continental shelf. Uh, we also want to give you as a potential bidder an overview of how to position yourself to be successful in submitting a good bid from a government procurement standpoint. We'll discuss in depth the administrative process for large and small businesses registering or bidding, bidding on a government contract, especially those who are embarking on something like this for the first time. It's important to the federal government to actively engage small business and disadvantaged businesses for growth opportunities. And that's something that we'll cover here later today. We also want to give you feedback so that we can do the best possible job in finalizing the uh, RFP language. And finally, we will set the expectations of our needs and various aspects covering the contract process. So over the next two hours, our experts in contracting operations and policy will address a range of important issues related to this draft RFP, including the administrative processes and the how to, so stay tuned. Uh, some of you may know Congress recently passed the uh, bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law as an investment in our nation's infrastructure and competitiveness. This law includes removal of orphan offshore oil and gas structures, and Bessie is focused on reducing the environmental risk posed by orphan in infrastructure and ensuring that uh, our communities most disadvantaged by the potential environmental and economic consequences can take part in the solution. Today's event is one of many steps Bessie has taken to broaden access to information and opportunity. And we welcome those of you today who can help us with this goal. The presentation today focuses on a well abandonment contract across the GOM, and there will be future op opportunities that we, we will discuss. There's a big job to do. Offshore work is complex and has special requirements and capabilities and needs. So we know we know the expertise is out there and our goal today is to spread the word that this is happening. We want to educate and clarify what it takes to bid and win the contract for removing these offshore orphan platforms that no longer serve our country's needs and which put a strain on the environment. 
So as we work together to advance our nation's efforts to be good environmental stewards, we want to ensure that the job is done efficiently, safely, and cost effectively while protecting workers, the environment, and the public public's best interests. So in, in closing, again, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us here today. We hope to attract and assist capable companies to bid on our work to increase the price price competitiveness. We want to encourage small and disadvantaged businesses to participate. And the team presenting here today are key technical subject matter experts in government contracting and in all that happens behind the scenes, including policy, operations, research, and more. And they are dedicated to understanding and addressing related issues. So your insight and expertise are important to Bessie, so, and we're glad to, to have you join us here today. If time allows at the end of today's discussion, we may have a, have a Q&A session. If we run out of time, we'll provide you a way to submit your questions for us to respond. So again, thank you, and, and that closes my comments, and I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Rudy Garza, which will which will Rudy will serve kind of as one of our primary uh, folks uh, working on this issue. So thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Mr. Brian Domain, our acting regional director for the Gulf of Mexico region for his opening comments. Uh, my name is Rudy Garza. I'm the project manager and technical lead uh, for this orphaned well decommissioning program. Uh, thank you for your interest in attending this virtual program. Would like to make a few points of clarification before we get started. Today's presentation is to a draft RFP uh, document that is subject to change. Because it is a draft, we can openly discuss the program particulars. Under official bidding guidelines, open communication is not allowed. At the present time, Bessie is not officially requesting any bid submissions. The intent of this presentation is to solicit feedback from you, the interested audience, regarding this program. The comments received will be reviewed and, if applicable, will be used to improve the program. We encourage your feedback. Any and all questions are welcomed. Partnering of bidders. Partnering of bidders is permitted for bid submission. Partnering allows the strength of each bidder to combine for a contract. Common to contract opportunities, some bidders not capable of meeting all the scope of work typically pass on the opportunity. Partnering op opens the opportunity for bidders to combine strengths and compete for government contracts to present a robust and cost effective bid. Next slide, please. I would like to draw your attention to the email address at the top of the agenda overview slide. Bessie Orphan Decom 2022 at Bessie.gov. That will be the method to submit correspondence regarding today's program, and it is a point of entry for any inquiries related to this program. It's a pretty important email address. We ask that you please notate it down. During the presentation, we offer a Q&A feature within Teams where questions can be submitted on more of a general nature. Due to time constraints, not all <clears throat> excuse me, submitted questions will be addressed during the presentation. If your question was not addressed, simply resubmit to the posted email address and we'll, you will receive a reply. Today's presentation will involve multiple speakers which will introduce themselves as they present. So let's begin looking at the presentation overview. Our plan today is to review the decommissioning program for the wells portion. We're going to talk about a data package, bidding and contracting with the federal government, 
and address the small and disadvantaged business office overview, which is part of the RFP. We'll talk a little bit about some questions and answers, and of course, we'll bring everything to a conclusion. Next slide, please. To give everyone an overview of basically what this project entails, starting from left to right. And again, this is a Wells portion of the decommissioning program. MI represents Matagorda Island, block 632, 656, 657. There are nine wells, one of which is in TA status. The location is about 13 miles from shore, 77 foot of water depth, seven caisson type structures. Moving to the middle, High Island 589, a platform. Two wells, 93 miles from shore, 477 foot of water, we're talking an eight pile structure. To the far right, West Delta 117 H platform. Four wells, distance to shore 27 miles. And again, that is the closest landmass. Water depth 199 feet. That is a four pile structure. Next slide, please. Basic overview on the project phases. For those familiar with decommissioning, this is a typical uh, project phase uh, decommissioning plan for any location in the Gulf of Mexico. Phase one will be the well decommissioning. There are two parts of that. The first part is what we're addressing today, which is a draft RFP for the well abandonment, and we're talking temporary well abandonment. That entails platform boarding, verification, isolation, and what we're calling make safe, make safe repairs. We'll get into more detail as we go through the presentation. Then we'll address the wells, either single plug isolation or what we're calling full TA or temporary abandonment. The next phase or the next part rather of phase one will be permanent abandonment. We envision that to be a separate mobilization with its unique bid uh, opportunity. That will entail, of course, the cutting and removal of all casing strings to 15 foot below the mud line. Depending on what is accomplished with the first portion of the TA phase, it may also have to carry over into the permanent abandonment phase. The second phase of this program is the pipeline and platform decommissioning. Pipeline abandonment entails isolation, purging, flushing, and filling. Cutting the pipeline risers, cover and bury to three foot below the mud line. This is on the premise that abandonment permitting will be for abandoned in place. Platform abandonment. Isolation, purging of any hydrocarbon and or pressurized vessels on the platform, flushing, retention of fluids, disposal, and then removal of the platform to 15 foot below the mud line. And then of course the final phase being site clearance. At the present time, the intent is to trawl, which is the most cost effective. Unique cases will involve sonar scan or diver verification. Next slide, please. To give you an idea of the range and challenges presented in this program, what you have presented in this slide are actual pictures, location pictures of various well and platforms across the Gulf that are involved in this RFP. Starting from the far left, Matagorda Island, 657. Typical caisson structure, roughly sitting about 75 feet above the waterline. Matagorda Island, 632. A low rise structure, anywhere between 20 feet to 25 feet above the waterline, typically known as a toadstool type structure. High Island, 589. 477 foot of water again. Uh, you're talking a multi 
leveled structure. That is an eight pile. To the far right, West Delta 117H platform. Four pile structure that is in about 200 foot of water. As you can tell by the pictures, each picture represents the, a different status of the structure and how they sit. Next slide, please. Being that this is a wells program, wanted to provide to you a listing of the wells that have been identified. This information will also give you some uh, starter information, if you will, that you can go out and through existing databases start collecting some data for those that are interested in this package. What I'll talk a little bit is right here at the bottom of the uh, list. The well depths range from 2,350 feet to 12,000 feet measured depth. Again, water depth ranges from 77 foot of water to 477 foot of water. The production makeup, Matagorda Island, pretty much gas and a light condensate type production. West Delta, High Island are a mix. You do have gas, but also black oil production, each with its unique challenges um, related to the production aspect. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do here is go over some points of clarification specific to the RFP. These are direct excerpts from the draft RFP, and you can download the RFP and look at it in more detail at your convenience. And it is, of course, uh, available. The contracting portion will go over specifically what is available and, and how to obtain that. The project goal is safe and effective well bore isolation and elimination of risk from the orphaned wells. I'd like to stress a couple of points there. These are orphaned wells. In that respect, the status of some of the structures and the wells is not definitively determined. So there's a unique challenge in that respect. Going back to the initial part of this sentence, the effective well bore isolation. The goal of this program is to effectively isolate the well. It may entail a full TNA or it may entail a single isolation plug. We'll get into a little bit more detail here uh, very soon. The second statement, Bessie has fiduciary responsibility to the public. With this RFP, we reserve the right to amend on a lease or well basis the scope of work or work plan to meet either budgetary constraints or other presented conditions. If we have to change a work of scope, then there are provisions for those changes to ensure that all parties are adequately compensated. Talking a little bit about the draft itself. This contract type will be to a firmed fixed price with a very specific scope of work. There are provisions for unplanned work. We're going to get into a little bit more detail here very soon. The decommissioning contractor, and we're going to speak to expectations of this RFP. The decommissioning contractor shall provide for all management, supervision, labor materials, supplies, equipment, accommodations, communications, transportation, dock services, and permitting all coordination efforts, basically otherwise known as very close to a full turnkey type contract. Contractor awarded, the anticipation or the expectation is, is that they're going to be providing all services. The contractor is also responsible for providing all requisite precondition items relative to permitting requirements, agreements, authorizations, notices, any type of permitting or compliance items that must be addressed. The contractor, it is anticipated that the contractor handle all of those or have provisions to be able to 
properly address all compliance issues, both at a federal and state level. The contractor shall provide for lodging for a maximum of two Bessie contracted personnel and all features that are included with that. We're going to have personnel on site. The contractor shall also provide services and materials to establish a regulation compliant NAVA. Now this refers to what we're calling the make safe repair portion of the bid. A regulation and compliant and working NAVA package inspection and or replacement of swing rope depending upon the condition of the boat landing providing for minimal firefighting capability and also addressing the emergency water life-saving equipment on the platform again all of that is anticipated to be in requirements of the bid and the bidding entities are to provide for such services next slide please <clears throat> Continuing on, the contractor shall provide services and materials for regulation compliant cranage on location. Any existing cranes, the contractor can inspect, repair, but it must be recertified to current regulation standards to be available for use. The contractor is to provide all services equipment and materials to gain access to each well and the well bore, specifically meaning if any rentals or unique or special services are required to gain entry into each well bore that is to be included in the contract bid. The contractor, and this is part of the safe boarding requirements, the contractor shall provide service to locate and close all primary departing pipeline riser valves for the facility. This is part of the make safe operations for isolation to make a safe working environment related to the facility. It may also entail, if required, depressuring of any associated uh, vessels or piping connected to the well whatever is required so that a safe environment is available for all working personnel. That is the anticipation and to be bid or included in the bid uh, for submission. The last two sections are extremely important and are pretty much established the basis for any interested bidder on how they're to premise their equipment spread. The contractor is to provide all relevant well services and downhole tooling customary to a rigless operation. That will be the premise and the base that the contractor will use in order to bid for this project. It goes into more detail about what is specific or what is considered to be services related to a rigless operation. Again, all this information is available uh, as a download opportunity. Um, on the website and will be identified by our contracting division. But basically any specialty work that is required related to a rigless operation shall be included in the contractor's bid. Uh, locking out of safety valves, downhole safety valves, very common operation that is also to be priced in the package considered to be a rigless operation. Four operations that are not or outside of the scope, if you will, of a rigless operation is addressed in the final section. For services deemed by the contractor necessary to complete the task, but they fall outside of the scope of a rigless operation, they're going to require to be included within the scope a detailed cost estimate identifying that item, unique item or service required. Goes into some explanation of what is considered to be outside the scope of a rigless operation. Milling, casing jacks, BOPs, coil tubing, snubbing, derrick barges. One important item to note here is the lift boat is not considered to be part of the rigless operation. For Matagorda Island, 
that is a common means to access those locations. That is to be detailed separately in the cost estimate. And continues on um, for the for other services as identified. Again, if you have any unique questions, the email address that was presented earlier, you can submit your questions via that email address and we'll respond to those. Next slide, please. Talking about what is required for the bid submission relative to the wells, there are additional requirements within the scope of the RFP or within the document of the RFP rather addressing different aspects. What this one specifically refers to is what is required for the to address the wells portion of the bid. To the left hand slide of the slot, excuse me, left hand side of the slide, I want to draw your attention to it. On a facility basis, a safe board plan is required as part of the bid. Cost estimates are to incorporate what is required to safe board and make safe repairs as identified in the RFP. Safe boarding and make safe repairs essentially are all costs involved in shoring up either grading, handrails, uh, removal services, any cutting services, basically anything required for initial board and to make the location safe for utilization. All of that is to be detailed on a per facility basis for the bid submission. Regarding the wells, we're going to ask for a single plug abandonment cost estimate. That single plug abandonment cost estimate is to include your initial mobilization charges, your setup, and any inspection requirements all related to that. That is basically the base level that <clears throat> we're going to be asking for, excuse me, uh, for each and every well. A second cost estimate is also required. That is the full well TA or temporary abandonment for the well, for that specific well. That is considered to be the continuation from the single plug abandonment cost estimate to avoid accounting of double costs. Mobilization is to be included in the single plug cost estimate. The full well TA takes it from the point of having the first plug set in the well or the single plug set in the well and going forward. A full scope of work and a proposed diagram full TA is also required and that is on a pull, full, uh, excuse me, per well basis. The following notations simply reference the section within the RFP for bid guidelines. There are templates provided in the data package, which will be covered here shortly, uh, that are to be utilized for the purposes of the bid. The reason for that is to maintain consistency across the board for all bidders so that we as an evaluation group can readily find line items and be able to compare directly across the board. Drawing your attention to the right hand side. Within the RFP, this is considered to be a roll up sheet. This is a summary sheet for all the bids. The justification material or the backup material are all the requirement documentation as identified in the RFP, including what we just went over on the left hand part of this slide uh, to be submitted in support of this roll up sheet. Drawing your attention to the first line item identified as B.5.1. That addresses the facility. Under the column working to the right, under the column where it actually says single plug price, with respect to the facility, that will actually be the combined cost of the safe board and the make safe repairs goes into that first column. Looking at the next line, B.5.2, that is that location will be where you are to enter the cost for the single plug abandonment as seen in the column of area 
well, we're talking about the first well being Matagorda Island 657 D1. That is specific, of course, to the well. Single plug cost estimate goes there. The next line, B.5.2.A, is for the second cost estimate entry. And of course, you can see that it directly across the final column, that's where that entry goes. And again, this is the roll up sheet for all the price submittals. And it continues on throughout the sheet. We have basically identified a base area contract, which is Matagorda Island lease G04139, and those wells are identified there. And the other lease, G03091, and those wells are identified there. That is considered to be a base contract. The other areas are considered to be options based on the construct of the government contracting process. All of that will be further discussed a little bit later on uh, in the program. Next slide, please. That pretty much concludes the overview of the well section and, pres and presented information for what is entailed within the package. I'm gonna turn it over to Eric Hawkins and he'll talk to you a little bit about the data packages uh, that are being that are included in the RFP. Eric. Thank you, Rudy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Hawkins, and I'm a geologist in the Bessie Office of Technical Data Management here in New Orleans. I'm also the Plan Contract Officer's Representative, or CORE, COR, for this effort. As the COR, I'll be working very closely with the Contract Officer, with Rudy as the Technical Lead, with other Bessie personnel, and with contractor representatives to ensure the administrative side of the contract runs as smoothly as possible before, during, and after operations. In my role as a data subject matter expert in our technical data office, I manage a variety of well and petrophysical database functions, work with numerous stakeholders across industry to address a wide variety of data-related issues, manage our well data processing contract, and co-manage the BSI data center. And I'll touch on that last point in our website in just a moment. Bessie has an abundant amount of data that we'll be providing to bidders as you consider offering a proposal for this procurement effort. Data will be provided in two different sections of the RFP, as well as via a DVD, which contains a large amount of information that we feel would be best delivered in a digital format. Section C of the RFP statement of work uh, in that in that document, you'll find the list of wells that Rudy discussed earlier, but most of the data will be found in Section J and the DVD. Section J is the RFP's list of attachments. It contains well information, such as a geologic and engineering review, well casing and tubing information, well bore diagrams, and images of pertinent log sections. It also contains facility information, including caisson schematics and platform assembly drawings and layouts. The DVD contains the majority of the data and information that we feel will be most helpful to you. The DVD includes a full suite of well log images for all the wells, an extensive variety of documents and permits associated with each well, directional surveys, considerable additional structure and facility information, pipeline reports, and a detailed set of aerial photographs of the facilities themselves. Lastly, the DVD contains templates that are to be used for bid response, including the cost estimate, the roll-up sheet, which Rudy detailed just a few moments ago, and a daily operations report. I mentioned the Bessie Data Center a moment ago, and it contains a wide variety of publicly releasable information, and you can find it online at data, .bessie.gov, and it's also mirrored over at data.boem.gov as well. I wanted to give the website a quick plug in case there are folks out there who are unaware of it and its resourcefulness for OCS data mining and gathering. If you ever have any questions, please contact us directly at TDM, Technical Data Management, TDM at bessie.gov, and one of our subject matter experts will assist you. And don't worry if you don't want to write that down, that email address is posted throughout the website. 
Mike, if you'd like to move ahead. This next, and uh, I know data is really boring, so luckily for all of you, uh, this is my absolute very last slide. You only get two slides from me. <laughs> it's just a small collage of the variety of data that you'll receive from us for review as you consider and prepare a bid. If you're interested in receiving the DVD that I've just spoken of, please contact us at the Rudy, or excuse me, at the, at the uh, uh, email address that Rudy mentioned earlier, the Bessie Orphan DCOM 2022 2022 email address .gov, uh, at Bessie.gov that Rudy noted in his opening remarks. That way our team can ensure that you receive a copy. Sorry about that. Thank you for your time. I, uh, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ms. Krishanda Smith, who is our contract officer, and she's going to delve into a very important and informative presentation about bidding and federal contracting. Krishanda, the floor is yours. Good morning, Good morning. and thank you, Eric. Uh, as he stated, my name is Krishanda Smith. I'm the contracting officer for this project. I'm located in Sterling, Virginia in the Acquisition Management Division of BSEE. And today I'm going to provide an overview of the bidding and contracting process. So what is SAM.gov? SAM stands for System for Award Management. It's a huge central database that includes all information about government contractors and provides a listing of all government contracting opportunities. It's known as the government point of entry. All solicitation information and notices pertaining to the formal decommissioning project as well as this draft is posted on SAM.gov website only. In order to do business with any federal government agency, you must complete a SAM registration. Once completed, the government assigns you a commercial and government entities code or cage code, which will be your firm's unique identifier in SAM. If your firm is already registered in SAM, please ensure that your registration has been updated because it will expire. Help resources are also available in SAM.gov by going directly to the Federal Service Desk at FSD.gov. You can search the knowledge database at any time or request help from an agent Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the number shown. Next slide, please. The request for proposal is structured using a uniform contract format. It's comprised of four different parts. Part one is the schedule and it houses sections A through H. Section H contains, excuse me, A contains your award document, the SF-1442. The contracting officer will sign this document at the time of award, showing official execution of the agreement between the contractor and the prime firm. Also included for your reference is a checklist to assist with proposal preparation and submission. Section B contains all of the bid sheets and pricing sheets that was discussed earlier by Rudy. All pricing must be completed or your proposal will be ineligible for award. So you must make sure that you submit all pricing documentation, complete all pricing as indicated in your RFP. Section C houses your scope of work. Section D indicates how the preparation of your packages and deliverables need to be submitted to the government. Section E discusses core responsibilities. That's the contracting officer representative, quality control and inspections and acceptance for the project. F describes where the work is to be performed and how commencement of the work is to take place. G is contract administration, which in provides instructions for how modifications to the contract are going to be taken care of, invoice preparation, submission, and payment. Section H identifies the special contract requirements that are specific for this project only and includes a listing of the suggested key personnel and the qualifications they must have, insurance requirements for the project, as well as COVID protocol. Next slide, please. 
Part two houses section I only, which is the contract clauses. And this is a list of all applicable contract clauses and provisions from the Federal Acquisition Regulation, also known as the FAR. And the FAR can be accessed at acquisition.gov website shown. The FAR is the principal set of rules regarding government procurement. It covers many contracts issued by the government, including the military and NASA. The FAR houses clauses and provisions that are included in full text and incorporated by reference in the draft RFP and in the formal RFP when issued. Part three is section J. It contains the attachments, drawings, specifications, forms, and all supplemental information that was described by Eric before me in the data package. And it also includes all forms and information noted as an attachment to the RFP. Part four is the representations and instructions. This houses sections K through M. K is the representations and instructions. When a firm is registering their company in SAM, you will provide information regarding your company in the SAM system during registration. So the representations and certifications is a generated report of the company's certifications that's included in your SAM's profile. Section L provides instructions for proposal preparation and submission. It also identifies the evaluation factors and sub factors inclusive of the small business subcontracting plan and the small disadvantaged business participation plan, both of which will be discussed later in the presentation. The small business subcontracting plan and the small disadvantaged business participation plan will be required by large firms only. Small firms do not have to submit or comply with, with those two plans. Section M, evaluation factors for award, describes how your proposal submission will be evaluated and selected for award. Next slide, please. The government will be procuring the commissioning services utilizing source selection best value trade off. This is found in the FAR under part 15 and you can see the website shown on the screen. This method allows the government to award a contract to a prime firm that does not necessarily submit the lowest price, but through the evaluation process, their proposal represents the best value to the government and is deemed a fair and reasonable price. The government will use one of two processes to evaluate and award up the contract. Next slide, please. One of the processes is called award with discussions. This method allows an opportunity for corrections and exchanges to occur during the solicitation and evaluation process. And I'll go through the flow chart as shown. First, an offeror must submit their proposals by the date and time specified in the RFP. If your proposal is late, it will not be considered for award. Initial evaluations are conducted by a technical evaluation committee and the competitive range is established. The competitive range are the offerors that are most probable to receive the award. If you're not included in the competitive range, the process stops for you. You will be notified of this in writing by the contracting officer. Should your firm be included in the competitive range, you will also be notified of that fact by the contracting officer and be prepared. We will ask that you be prepared to, uh, to have discussions with the technical evaluation committee. In your notification, we will identify the weaknesses or correctable deficiencies that you will need to be prepared to address during discussions, which may also include oral presentations. 
During discussions and oral presentations, the firms have an opportunity to meet in person or via virtual with the technical evaluation committee. You address the elements identified, and at the end of that session, you have an opportunity to participate in a Q&A session with the technical evaluation committee. Upon completion of discussions, you will be asked to submit a final proposal revision for submission, and we will request that be received by a particular time and date. The final proposal revision will be submitted for re-evaluation, and the board will adjust your scores up or down in accordance with your initial scores provided at the beginning of your evaluation. After this, an award decision will be made. And once the selection is made, the actual signing and execution of the award will occur. After award, you will be notified who the selected firm is. Those that are not selected, you all have an opportunity as well as the selected firm to be debriefed. Any requests for debriefing must be submitted in writing to the contracting officer. Next slide, please. A second process for evaluations is award without discussions. Similar to the first method shown, you submit proposals. In this case, there are no evaluations. A comp excuse me, there are evaluations, but there is no competitive range or discussions. Then we go into the award decision. The contract is executed and you still have the opportunity for debriefings. Offerers are encouraged to submit their best proposal first. If there is initial proposal submission that satisfies the government's need with a high prob probability of success at a fair and reasonable price, there may be no need to, to conduct discussions. And so the government could possibly award without discussions at the onset. Next slide, please. When a firm is awarded a contract, they are considered to be the prime firm or prime contractor. A prime firm is the company that has the primary responsibility for the overall completion of a project. The prime firm is being hired by the project owner, who is the government, to oversee the entire work process. The government has a contract relationship with the prime firm only. The government does not have a contractual relationship with any subcontractors that are selected to do the work. The prime firm has a relationship with all subcontractors. The prime firm is responsible for the hiring, coordinating and managing of all work performed by the subcontractors. So if there's an issue with a subcontractor's work, the government will work directly with the prime firm to resolve any of those concerns. Next slide, please. The prime firm is responsible for obtaining all required bonding. Bid bonds, also known as a bid guarantee, is used to provide assurance to the government that the bidder has the expertise and the wherewithal to finish the job once selected. This bond is submitted along with your firm's proposal. The bid guarantee amount shall be at least 20% of the bid price or $3 million, whichever is less. Payment bonds is a type of surety bond which guarantees that a contractor or subcontractor will pay their subcontractors, materials suppliers, or laborers. laborers. And the payment bond must be in 100% of the awarded contract value. Performance bonds is also a surety bond to guarantee satisfactory completion of a project by the contractor. This too is required to have 100% of the awarded contract value. And the contracting officer will provide a copy of the payment and performance bonds for execution at the time of contract award. And it will specify the amount that they are 
to get the bonding executed for. Next slide, please. Prime firms are also responsible for the submission of all invoices. Subcontractors will submit their invoices and support documentation to the prime firm. The prime will in turn submit a single invoice package inclusive of their and all of their subcontractors invoices and support docs for the work performed. Subcontractors cannot submit their individual invoices directly to the government. The prime firm shall submit the invoice package electronically only to the IPP system at IPP.gov as shown on the screen. And the government shall inspect and confirm that all work invoiced for has been completed in an acceptable manner prior to approval for processing in the system. Next slide, please. The government shall pay the prime firm only via electronic transfer within 30 days, 14 days if you are a small business, after receipt and acceptance of the invoice package. If the prime firm is not paid within the time stipulated, interest will accrue for each day payment is not made and shall be paid to the contractor in addition to the amount invoiced for. The prime firm is responsible for paying their subcontractors in a timely manner. If a prime does not pay their subcontractor, the subcontractor has the right to contact the contracting officer to obtain a copy of the payment bond, and in turn, they can contact your surety company to file a claim for payment. Next slide, please. Once proposals are submitted to the government for your formal solicitation, the following documents are used to evaluate your proposal. The request for proposal itself, the source selection plan, and the offeror's proposal. The RFP are the requirements that are published in SAM by the government, and this will describe the work that is being solicited for and provides instruction for proposal preparation, submission, and evaluation, all that we have just gone over. The source selection plan is the document which details how the procurement will be managed, the roles and responsibilities of all team members, and provides instructions regarding how the proposals will be evaluated, scored, ranked, and recommended for award. This document is not made public to the prospective offerors. This is an internal document for evaluation only. In addition, of course, we will use the offeror's proposals as a part of this process. Each firm's proposal is evaluated against the criteria that's specified in the RFP and source selection plan only. Offerors' proposals are not compared to each other. I want to repeat that. An offeror's proposal is not compared to another offeror's proposal. Next slide, please. The source selection evaluation team members or the technical evaluation committee are comprised of the following people. There's a source selection authority, which can also be the contracting officer, assists with the preparation, review, and posting of all procurement inf information. It directs the entire selection process, appoint the members to the board, and this person makes the final decision after they receive a recommendation by the technical evaluation committee or source selection evaluation board after an in-depth review and consideration of all the information and data available. The contracting officer assists with the preparation and review of all procurement information, manages the entire procurement process from cradle to grave, and also awards and manages the resulting contract through contract closeout. The Source Selection Evaluation Board, or the TEC, are persons that are identified to serve on a board in a one-time capacity. They are responsible for reviewing and evaluating the proposals. 
They are voting members. That means they get to score and they provide a ranking of the proposals based on the evaluation criteria, and they are the ones that provide the recommendation to the source selection authority or contracting officer for award. They are required to sign a non-disclosure statement and a statement of conflict of interest. Next slide, please. Technical advisors are the subject matter experts that assist the technical evaluation committee with review of the content in their area of specialty. They are allowed to provide their comments to the panel for members, to the panel members, excuse me, for their consideration. They are non voting members of the board, so they do not rank and they do not score proposals. They too are required to sign a certificate of non-disclosure and a statement of conflict of interest. And lastly, they're the legal advisors, which ensure the legal sufficiency of all procurement documents. They review all of the reports that are associated with the evaluations, and they also assist with any other legal concerns which may result in a protest or a claim. Next slide, please. And lastly, we'll discuss procurement integrity. During the solicitation process, prospective offers shall send all communications to the contracting officer or desic email only. There is to be absolutely no communication with any other government employee or official regarding the solicitation while the solicitation is occurring. Proposals will be evaluated only by the persons on the evaluation board and the contracting officer. As a reiteration, all board members will sign a conflict of interest statement and a non-disclosure agreement. This is important because should any procurement sensitive information be discussed with persons not authorized, the procurement may be canceled after a procurement integrity violation investigation has been conducted. And once the contract has been awarded, only the contractor can execute changes to the contract. The contractor should not proceed with any additional work unless a modification has been executed. Should the decommissioning contractor proceed with work directed to be, be performed by an unauthorized, unauthorized person, the firm is proceeding at their own risk of not being paid. The contracting officer will delegate a contracting officer's representative or, or core. The decommissioning contractor will receive a copy of this delegation, and the delegation may allow the core to direct the contractor to perform work for emergency situations only. There will be stipulations and accommodations in the contract to accommodate for emergency situations or situations that need to be responded to immediately. So please know that there are recourses to take care of that, and we will go further into that once we award the contract. Now this concludes the acquisition portion of the presentation. Next, you will hear from Mr. Leroy Williams, to discuss the Small Disadvantaged Business Participation Plan. Thank you, Chris Shonda. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. As Chris Shonda mentioned, my name is Leroy Williams, and I am a small business specialist within the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization at the Department of the Interior. Our director of our office, as Ms. Colleen Finnegy. I wanted to take a moment to share with you a little about the larger DOI mission and the work of OSTABU and our small business advocates within the Department of the Interior, as well as provide some information on small business participation as an evaluation factor before passing the mic to Terry, who is going to share with you the specifics a Bessie small business program and work. The Department of the Interior, our mission is protecting America's great outdoors 
empowering our future. The Department of the Interior protects and manages the nation's natural resources and cultural heritage, provides scientific and other information about those resources, and honors its trust responsibilities or special commitments to American Indians, Alaska Natives, and affiliated island communities. Next slide, please. How is DOI organized? Within DOI, we have eight, eight bureaus and two offices, each with unique missions that provides contracting opportunities. Astabu is a resource to better understanding those missions and various requirements needed to meet their missions. A bit later, I'll share with you some resources and tools to further explore our Bureau's individual buying needs and requirements. So how does DOI work and where does Ostabu and Bessie fit in? Each of the eight bureaus and two offices report to one of the five assistant secretaries, including Bessie. The DOI Ostabu reports directly to the Deputy Secretary of the Interior and is responsible for implementing policies, procedures, and training programs for the department to emphasize DOI's commitment to contracting with small and disadvantaged businesses and conduct outreach to those same communities. The DOI procurement landscape is vast, but designed to help small businesses engage. As I mentioned, the Asabu is one source of support. Another is our headquarter, small business specialists, who are the principal point of contact in each bureau and office for the small business vendor, the bureau program staff, who determine the business need, and the bureau contracting staff who manage the procurement process, all of which you are hearing from today. Next slide, please. Where and what does DOI buys? As you can see on the slide there in front of you, you see where all our contracting offices are located, our bureaus spread out throughout the Southwest, North, Southeast, and the Midwest. So now that I've shared the mission and organizational structure, I wanted to share with you a quick glance of where DOI buys. The map depicts our location of our contracting offices and their spend. Our two major spend offices are our Lakewood facility located in Colorado and our Washington DC offices, which includes the Bessie contracting office. On this slide, you will also find some websites and resources that may be helpful including the DOI forecast of contracting opportunities, which is a listing of potential contracts that may be issued in a given fiscal year and others in which you may find DOI opportunities. Next slide, please. DOI Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, known as the OSDBU. Some people in the industry say Ostabu. The OSDBU Small Business Program Office provides continuous assistance to DOI small business community to maximize procurement and contracting opportunities for small and disadvantaged businesses. Support all DOI bureaus, including the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, known as BSEE. Provide general information and resources to small business community. Assist in connecting vendors to bureaus collaborate with the Small Business Administration, DOI's Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Civil Rights, and our sister federal agencies. The Department and Bessie excels at small business engagement. In fiscal year 2021, DOI exceeded our small business goal by more than 10%, awarding more than $2.4 billion to small businesses and exceeding our socio-economic categories. It is under this program that the Ostabu invites and welcomes small business participation 
and all of our contracting opportunities. So on the slide, you can see where our SBA gave us our goal as 50.0%. The Department of Interior achievement of that goal was 60.8%. So at the Department of Interior, we call ourselves a small business friendly agency. Most small businesses within the industry looks at our department and achieve great success. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the small business participation as an evaluation factor. In support of our mission and our drive to maximize procurement and contracting opportunities for small and disadvantaged business communities, DOI has been utilizing small business participation as an evaluation factor on an optional basis since 2019. Small business participation as an evaluation factor allows for the evaluation of proposed participation and commitment to the use of U.S. small businesses in the performance of the acquisition. Incentives, the diversification of large firm supply changes and the expansion of DOI's small business vendor base and strengthens small vendors through subcontracting. The evaluation factor allows us to evaluate proposals to determine which offeror proposes the best value in terms of small business participation. Keeping in mind that small businesses will also be evaluated, but we will, but will receive the maximum score for the factor. And some key elements of this, this procedure is to evaluate the standard proposed participation, commitment to the U.S. small businesses in the performance of, that, of this acquisition. Also, incentivize the diversification of large firm supply chains and the expansion of DOI's small business vendor base. And then again, strengthen small vendors through subcontracting. Next slide, please. I appreciate the time today to share with you a little bit about the Department of the Interior, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, and the Small Business Participation as an Evaluation Factor. Above you will find the contact information for the OSIBU as well as our website. If you have any question about DOI and or the DOI Small Business Program, please don't hesitate to reach out or check out our website. Our website gives you has our DOI procurement opportunities on there. We have our event schedules, which give you events throughout the federal government for small business to attend and get more insight. So we welcome you to take a look at that website. It also includes a listing of our small business specialists for each of our eight bureaus and two offices. Those are, like I said earlier, those are your point of contact when introducing yourself and building a relationship with the Department of the Interior. So again, visit our website. You have our point of contact information for the OSIBU office there on screen. With that, I will pass the mic over to Terry Manifich, the Bessie Headquarters Small Business Specialist, to share more about Bessie's small business program. Again, thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Leroy. Um, I, I think with with my presentation here, I'm going to kind of slide over my slides because a lot of the presenters have already given you um, a lot of the information that I would have um, given you, but it will 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 keep it rolling. Next slide, please. Um, first, my name is Terry Manovich and I am the headquarters small business specialist for um, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, also known as Bessie. Um, our mission, as Mr. Domain had um, previously um, told you in his beginning remarks, that we promote the safety, we protect the environment, we are conservation advocates for resources through vigorous regulatory oversight and enforcement. And some of those functions include field operations, including permitting and research, inspections, offshore regulatory program, oil spill response, 
and training and environmental compliance and now decommissioning. Um, we have several offices with that within the United States for Bessie. Um, our headquarters is in DC. There's also headquarters in Sterling, Virginia. We have an office in our Goma region in, um, in off the coast of the OCS. We have an office in Houston, Texas. We have a Pacific region in Camarillo, California, and we have our Alaska region office, which is located in Anchorage. Next slide, please. Just a couple quick facts um, that um, I'd like to share about Bessie and, and their drive to um, be conservationist in, um, in the OCS and other parts. They conduct more than 20,000 inspections per year to ensure the safety of over 1,750 offshore facilities. They operate the only facility in the world that can test full-size oil spill response equipment with a variety of crude oils and refined petroleum products under the reproductible marine conditions. The facility is set off of um, in one of the Atlantic um, states and has been in motion for quite some time. They also work with the Ocean Energy Safety Advisory Committee to facilitate collaboration and, co and coordinate amongst other government agencies and industries on issues related to offshore drilling, workplace safety, well intervention, oil spill prevention, blowout containment, and oil spill response. They conduct research regarding operational safety and pollution prevention, technologies related to offshore oil, natural gas, and renewable energy exploration and development. Next slide, please. The functions and tasks related to the dollar spent are similar to what Bessie actually does. Um, for instance, oil and gas permitting, facilities inspections, which we just went over, offshore leasing, resource evaluation, um, renewable energy development, economic analysis. We work with the um, NEPA, which is the National Environment Policy Act, um, on analysis and environmental studies. We collaborate on decision making um, policies regarding the development of domestic offshore conventional and renewable energy resources, including ensuring that appropriate consideration of the environment is given in every case. Daily operation functions of BSEE uh, to keep to uh, on our administrative side um, include furniture, system software, copiers, equipment, um, telecommunications, um, personnel assistance, personnel security, EEO, um, preparations, um, preparation services, and other actions to maintain the daily operations of the Bureau. Next slide, please. Our small business program here at Bessie um, was established to assist the small businesses and the socioeconomic groups to provide tools to help them maximize contract opportunities and compete successfully, um, also to help them grow and develop. We continue to foster an, environmental, uh, an environment um, where small business and so socioeconomic categories know where to find contract opportunities, um, and this happens by me touching base with small businesses, um, having meetings with small businesses. Um, they reach out. Um, I find if there's any opportunities that that they can um, maybe um, apply for. Um, and we go from there. Um, I distribute their capability statements. Uh, to the program offices for the opportunities that Leroy had um, previously mentioned in the forecast of opportunities under the DOI small business page. We ensure that large businesses are representing them, representing them, representing, sorry, maximum subcontracting opportunities for small and socioeconomic businesses. And this particular requirement does require subcontracting um, plan, which I will we'll go over in one of my later slides. Um, again, the procurement business opportunities, which um, a few of our presenters have touched on, I've given you 
of some links here in this next um, paragraph. One is for the government opportunities, which is the SAM.gov, and I believe that this requirement will be um, solicited through SAM.gov as an open market. Also, if you go to the DOI.gov site, um, I've put in a link for the forecast for contract opportunities. There you will see a list of item numbers and descriptions. Um, it also gives you for Bessie, it will give you my information and you can contact me directly. I can update you on um, where the requirement is in the acquisition process. So these products and services that we purchased mainly are under larger next codes, engineering services, oil spill technology studies, information technology, consulting services, and, and as I mentioned before, office products to keep us uh, running on daily operations. Next slide, please. So the subcontracting plan requirements, I'm just going to go briefly over this because they are spe specified and they will be specified in the um, solicitation for you. The FAR requires large businesses to submit a subcontracting plan for the contracts that meet thresholds under FAR Part 19.702, which I have linked if you'd like to read the whole FAR part. It's very lengthy, uh, but to pick out a few, um, the, the subcontracting plan is required for any award that goes to a large business, that any action that individually is expected to exceed $750,000, or in this case, maybe $1.5 million for construction, and that has subcontracting possibilities. We're hoping that, that this uh, requirement will, will have subcontracting possibilities for our small businesses. Contractors must use the electronic subcontracting uh, report system, which is the ESRS, to report their subcontracting accomplishments. This is after the award has been made. The CO will include language related to the DOI's annual subcontracting goals for maximum small business participation in the solicitation that must be addressed in the response. The received plan will be reviewed by contracting staff to make sure that it meets the required submission per regulations and policies. If it does not, the CO will take steps and reach out to the response. Next slide, please. Just a few, um, I'm not gonna go over the whole thing here, but just a few of our uh, NICS codes that are related, so you can take a look at them to see if you um, are listed under any NICS codes um, that are shown here, daily, the daily operations requirements that I had spoke of previously. Most are done on GWAC, um, which is the GSA FSS schedule and or NASA soup. If you are in one of those um, plan vehicles already, the NICS codes um, IT related are below. Um, 334113, um, and there are several other ones that we um, utilize during any given fiscal year to procure um, daily operations requirements. Procurements above 25K, which cannot be procured through the, um, the government-wide contracts, um, are posted on SAM.gov. And then there are other requirements um, that contain different NAICS codes more underneath of the research and development NAICS codes, uh, studies, um, impact statements, engineering, data analysis, survey, and mapping. These are not all inclusive. Um, next slide, please. The general administrative NAICS activities other than described on the previous page um, which are UPS, USPS, these are, um, these are also daily operations. These are mainly procured on the GSAFS schedule. These obviously will not impede on this requirement as they're not anywhere near the same next code. So, um, but last year we've excelled just as DOI has um, in FY21. Bessie completed approximately 451 actions totaling 90 million plus dollars. 187 of those were to small businesses totaling 61 million plus dollars, which equates to about 60 67% of the dollars spend on small business. 
I just want to say that you have to be diligent in your efforts if you're a small business and reach out to whatever tools and use whatever tools um, you have in order to maintain and grab the maximum um, opportunities that are offered for you. Next slide, please. Um, as, as the presenters prior had given you all of the requirements um, in order to do business with the government first, obviously you have to be registered in um, SAM. The possibilities for um, looking into getting on the schedule, if you're not on the schedule, um, I've put a link to the GSA.gov um, site for you to find out more information. Our IT procurements, um, which are a lot of them are done on the NASA soup. I've also given you the link to the NASA soup.gov site so you can find out more information on how to get onto that schedule as well. Um, as Leroy had mentioned earlier, the Ozdebu office um, is a, a, a wide variety of wealth um, of information on how to do business with DOI and its bureaus. Um, contact SBA, which is the Small Business um, Administration, to learn how to partner with large businesses for prime and subcontracting possibilities. They also have a mentor protege program, um, so you, you would definitely need to contact SBA for the current processes on that. Um, and it has just been given an overhaul by SBA. So make sure that uh, you have a large mentor already to participate with you, um, but check the site first to find out what the actual requirements and the, the current processes are. Next slide, please. And that's it for me, but my information is contained on this slide, um, my email address. So if you have any questions on any opportunities that you see, um, if you go to the forecast, um, or if you would like to send your capability statement to me, um, please feel free to do so. My email is, is here for you. And this concludes my presentation, but I would like to thank all of you too for being here today and spending some time with us and learning about what we do at Bessie, um, how we champion small business um, by doing these industry days um, and having, you know, our our DOI Ozdebu speak and we have everyone in the acquisition um, process represented today. So thank you again for your time and I'm going to turn this back over to uh, Rudy. OK, thank you very much, Ms. Terry. Um, Basically, that concludes the data presentation portion uh, for today. The Q&A session planned, unfortunately, will not occur. We've run into some technical difficulties with that. We ask that you please submit your questions to the email noted on the slide, the Bessie Orphan DCOM 2022 at Bessie.gov, and we'll address them. It is also your opportunity and your entry point for any other inquiries, where to go, who do I need to talk to, and other uh, aspects, including if you missed any portion uh, of the presentation, a copy of this presentation will be made available. The unique opportunity with this presentation is that in with involving the small business and disadvantaged business offices it provides an opportunity and an avenue for interested parties to have a dialogue with those two groups to basically find out is my business capable am i structured properly what does this acronym stand for um and basically ask questions related to can I or can my business have a business relationship with the federal government in different opportunities and manners. It's an open door opportunity. We invite all interested members, please take advantage of that. Um, all that being said, we thank you for your time. We hope that you have found information useful we anticipate within the next two months, potentially sooner, that we will have an official issuance of an RFP for the well decommissioning portion 
available on again on sam.gov we ask that you continue to monitor the website take the time now to pre-register get all of that out of the way perform some additional research with the draft rfp that has been issued utilize that as your research tool to better prepare for the rfp that will be issued within the next couple of months beyond that thank you for your time we appreciate your interest and if we can be of service to you please let us know thank you